So, amazing journey of one of our leading entrepreneurs. And now, uh, Shaheen Mistry, who, uh, again, if I may say, is someone whose heart led her into setting up what are, in fact, two of India's leading not-for-profit organizations, Akanksha first, and I know what she ran at Akanksha. Uh, my daughter actually uh, began to spread her wings in the space of uh, understanding and working with young children through the Akanksha that uh, was built by Shaheen. And then, of course, going on for Teach for India, which uh, uh, she has built. And uh, her journey there is a great journey. Uh, Shaheen is almost too shy to tell it, but uh, her chapter is a very lyrical chapter which describes what led her into this amazing space which uh, she leads with such passion and uh, which actually touches on countless young people uh, around our country. So, Shaheen, over to you. I just want to echo the, the gratitude. I think Naina's book has given such a voice to the work that we do at Agangsha and Teach for India, so thank you for that. Um, by way of introduction, I'm just going to share a story from the week. On Saturday, uh, I was visiting one of our schools and one of our teachers ran up to me down the corridor and she said, I have to tell you what's happened with three of my kids. So she's teaching in a, a BMC school, municipal school in Mumbai. Um, and now she's moved to Pune and she's teaching in another school in Pune. So she said her kids call her up to say that they wanted to go to an international school. They reached class 7 and they wanted to go to the Lexicon International School. So they showed up at the school, they went to the office and the people in the office in Hindi told them, this is not a school for BMC kids, you can leave. So they said, wait a minute, our Didi has told us about the right to education and about the 25% reservation and that you cannot deny us the ability to interview in your school. Cut a long story short, they went through the interview process. They were told at the interview process that they outperformed all the other kids that applied that year and they got into the school. And then two weeks ago, this boy who's now in the school calls her up in Pune and says, Didi, I have to tell you there's a big problem with our school. And so she says, what's the problem? And uh, he says, you know how at Teach for India, uh, you all teach us that first we have to have a vision and big goals. There's no vision and big goals in our school. So can you mail me a PowerPoint so that I can do a training session at my school for my teachers? Um, and like, you know, my reason for existence, I love the way that, that you shared yours. My reason for existence is that day when um, I don't have to tell that story and you don't have to clap because it's so normal, you know. And yet today we're so far in our country because these examples do make us so excited, me in telling it, you in hearing it. Um, and so that, that, that's me, I think. I've just spent, you know, 25 years um, in trying to solve that problem. How do we end inequity in the country and hold that bar of excellence that Kiran spoke about for every person, irrespective of background, irrespective of where they are, what they want to do. You know, I, I tell my Teach for India fellows, don't try to provide your children some education. Try to say how can they go further than where you are today. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here. One, one last quick thing, we actually launched in Bangalore a month ago. Um, so today and yesterday were my first journey into visiting our fellows who've been teaching anywhere from three days to one month um, in government schools, Canada medium schools in the city. So that's a very, very exciting um, and so excited to be here. So are you, are you recruiting other fellows and people from this audience? Most definitely. <laughs> what, what are you looking for? Um, I think just, just support in every possible way, in spreading an awareness, in um, pushing people to change their mindsets about what's possible with kids, in coming in and volunteering in the schools, 
giving resources into the schools. None of the schools have libraries, science labs, um, basic resources in schools. So anyone that wants to uh, get engaged, please feel free to drop me an email and we'll definitely find a way. So I'm not going to let you off so lightly because I knew that you were going to uh, hold back. Uh, you talk about from dreaming how the world could be. I started dreaming of how we could get there. And that's the journey that uh, you describe in your book. I read your chapter, I think, yet again for probably the hundredth time, Shine, And uh, I want you to just share with the audience your story of Latif, because it still brings tears to my eyes. Sure. Um, so this is the story that I've told most often in my life, just to keep it alive for myself as well. I have many, many wonderful stories of kids, just blessed to have met so many incredible kids who've shaped me. But this was, you know, they always tell you as a teacher, don't have a favorite. Um, I always had my favorites, um, and this story is about one of my favorites. So Latif came into one of our classrooms when he was around 10 years old, um, and unlike most kids who enter our classrooms and the teachers want to tear their hair out because they're so naughty and it takes them so long to settle down, Latif was the opposite. He was just good at everything. He was this incredible, handsome, talented, friendly, Incredible kid. I, I describe him best as one of those rare people who all of us have in our lives where when they walk into the room, the whole room just becomes a little bit better just because of their presence in the room. So anyway, um, Latif was from a very poor family, lived in a 10 foot by 10 foot square home, didn't have a father, lived with a grandfather who adored him to death. He, he sort of lived for his grandfather. His dream was to get his grandfather to stop working and so to earn enough money. So while he was in college, he was coming to our gangsha, he was in college, he was um, the star of our big musical, he was doing all these things and he was working at Cafe Coffee Day at night so that he could earn enough for his grandfather to stop working. Um, fast forward a couple of years after we staged this big musical, everything's going wonderfully in Latif's life and he suddenly passes away, gets an acute respiratory illness and um, 12 hours later, I'm on my way to Pune. By the time I reach back to Mumbai, uh, Latif is gone. The reason I tell this story is the next morning I was in his home with his grandfather and his grandfather said, he said, Didi, you know, I knew Latif was really unwell and so I took 14,000 rupees that I had earned over many months and I put it in Latif's hand and I said, Latif, promise me you won't go to a government hospital. Promise me you'll go to a good doctor. And because Latif didn't want his grandfather to go back to work, he took that money, hid it under the bed, went to a government hospital, passed away 12 hours later. Again, I have no idea about whether the, the, the outcome would have been any different. Um, maybe it was his time to go. But I know what happened that day was I changed, something in me just shifted. I think for many years I had felt I knew what it meant to give and I think Latif told me that I didn't have any idea of our human capacity to give of ourselves. And I thought if this 20 year old could have that much unconditional love in his heart for another human being such that he would put his life on the line for someone that he cared about, then of course I can do that little bit more every day even when I think I've done enough. Um, yeah. 14,000 bucks and the love of a grandfather.